Mostly Homer free, and I think that's going to come in handy today. Absolutely. Hello again, everyone, my fellow Bears fans, to another edition of Chicago Football Talk Live. Let me get that logo up there. There it is. Your boy Roy, your humble host, as always, for Chicago Football Talk. By the fans, for the fans, uh, fanalists, fanalysis, and all of the good fancy fan words you can use. We always start this show off here with beer, a libation of choice. And tonight's libation of choice is from Southern Tier. It's their double imperial ale. It's not one of the most fantastic double IPAs. They haven't changed the recipe much since it's come out. And there's been a lot more bolder double IPAs to come out. But anyway, it is the libation of choice tonight for people that don't like bitter IPAs. I think you'll like this one. It's got a mild smell to it. It's overall, it's mild. You see that little lemony yellow gold fl- uh, look to it. But cheers, everybody. Tear my beer after the Bears got their butt whooped by the Green Bay Packers. And that's what we're going to talk about and break down here. Cheers, everybody. Mm-mm. And my palate is crisply clean. Uh, I think, again, I've been spoiled by having so many excellent libations. But this one is not that bad. It hits the mark. But anyway, we've got a lot to talk about. Going back to the Bears-Green Bay game, the Bears have moved on. I think most fans need to move on. Interestingly enough, since that game was on national TV on Thursday night, you had so many fans around the world have the opportunity to watch that meltdown. Primetime has not been kind to the Bears, or I should say the other way around. The Bears have not been very kind to primetime lately here. And there was no Mike Martz to blame, only Mike Tice. Uh, There was the offensive line to blame. There was definitely Jay Cutler to blame. It was a total team failure on offense. I think going into this game, after the Bears-Colts game, most fans thought the worry was going to be about the defense. Most people that picked the Bears to lose uh, was because of their defense, basically primarily saying there's no way you can stop Aaron Rodgers, you know, Uh, He's a god in football cleats and shoulder pads, and I got Mr. MVP, and even though he's had a few crappy games, and if you go across the border north to Wisconsin, they're pretty worried about their quarterback right now, so uh, even though they think they have it bad, things couldn't be worse than they are here right now in Chicago. We got fans fighting fans. And a media fanning the flames, if you will, uh, over the weekend. Uh, they've got articles to write. So, of course, they're going to, you know, keep scratching that itch, keep, you know, knowing they're going to get a lot of hits. And I'm not going to criticize the media for, uh, I'm not going to go so far as to try to blame them for what's going on here. I see Brad Biggs and all kinds of media guys are taking a lot of heat right now for simply reporting what is newsworthy, like DJ Moore's comments today. Basically saying that he was surprised he didn't notice what the interaction that happened between Cutler and Webb uh, when during the game that he was playing. I'm sure he was focused on defense and it kind of happened off the field. There's a lot of people on the sideline. If he was sitting down on the bench, then I could see how he wouldn't have seen it. Uh, But he wasn't too happy when he saw it on the replay. Now they went to, you know, they both went to Vanderbilt. But DJ Moore, I think he's got it in perspective too. You know, if it were to happen to him, he wouldn't take to it that kindly. The thing is. The guys that work with Cutler the most on offense are the offensive line, is the, his teammates on offense. Of course, defensive guys, they wouldn't take it lightly because they don't even, you know, you have a brotherhood as a team. You all wear the same logo, but your brotherhood really is to that's whatever side of the ball you play. The special teams brethren have a brethren. The defense has a brethren. The offense has a brethren. So I wouldn't be surprised if anybody on defense would react the way uh, DJ Moore said he would have reacted to Cutler. Likewise, I'm not surprised that People on the offense didn't react the way some people said that they should, like basically punching him in the mouth or or I would have done this or I would have done that if that was Cutler doing that to me. Those guys know him. He's their leader. They know his tenor. They know his demeanor. I'm not going to make any excuses for Cutler. Uh, Honestly, I think he deserves the heat that he's getting right now because he's the guy that made he's the guy that did what he did. So I'm not going to side for him. I'm not going to defend and say, you know, he shouldn't be catching any heat or people shouldn't be questioning his leadership abilities. Everybody's entitled to their own opinion and everybody's been weighing in, whether it's Skip Bayless or David Hall. You got some people that are on the outside looking in happen to be the most logical people basically saying Cutler is who he is. My thoughts on it for everybody who's keep asking me my thoughts, and I did shed some light on those thoughts on my YouTube breaking down the Bears uh, loss to the Packers, my offline video. 
is that I honestly, it, I don't have a problem with it. You know, everybody has their own style of leadership they appreciate. But honestly, I mean, the guy's been getting his butt kicked for years. Eventually, you know, they have high hopes, a lot of high expectations. They wanted to come in there and make a statement versus Green Bay. A lot was riding on the line. So I don't actually have a problem with it. Now, DJ Moore, I don't let, you know, begrudge him for, for taking issue with it. And that is his teammate. Matt Bowen, for example, chimed in on it saying he didn't, you know, he wasn't real happy with it, scratching his head. Where's the real Jay Cutler? Honestly, that's the same Jay. I don't know which Jay Cutler you guys have been watching, but that's the same Jay Cutler that's been here for years. He bit his tongue for quite a while, and a lot of people seem to overlook that. He basically did uh, has more protected his offensive line than he has thrown them under the bus. It's happened to K but it's probably four or five to one the times that he stood up for them versus the times that he's taken veiled or questioned them publicly so again in the heat of battle he had just gotten sacked and that drive just got killed basically because Webb lost the one-on-one -on -one. the other factor in the equation here again and I'm not taking sides people I think seem to be overlooking what about Jamarcus Webb's personality qualities or his traits okay it could just be that Jay Cutler has seen things and qualities in Jamarcus Webb that made him react that way to Jamarcus Webb specifically. Maybe in Cutler's mind, he's questioned Jamarcus Webb's passion at times, his intensity at times. I'm not questioning it. I'm just saying maybe he has. And so maybe he basically questions the seriousness or level of seriousness with which he takes in de defending and protecting Jay or, or bringing it on every single play. So maybe Jay Cutler decided, hey, you better get it together, okay? I've, I, you know, I put up with your slack and in practice, but I'm not going to put up with it during the game. So I'm just saying there's dynamics here. And for anyone to just say they know for a fact i appreciate your respect your opinion if you don't like the leadership style that he presented but everybody people you need to communicate with people differently there's no one way to communicate with every single person some people you have to talk to them extensively some you don't have to talk to them at all some people you have to raise your voice a little bit with in order for them to get your attention and some you have to respect you know very even keely and and treat them as a man so that the message doesn't get lost so i think Part of the reason Webb didn't react as negatively as everybody across the country thinks he should have is because uh, that's the way Webb is, and Cutler knows that. So anyway, not taking sides. Again, deserves all the heat that, that he's getting right now because everybody, when you do that and you're on the stage and you react the way that you did, uh, fans are going to question you, and that just comes with the territory. That's all I'm saying. Uh, it comes with the territory, so I'm sure Jay Cutler's like, whatever, no big deal. Just like DJ Moore said, is it, it, uh, if Jay Cutler publicly apologized like Teddy Bruschi thought he should, uh, the fans would question, or his own teammates would question it, because that's not the kind of guy Jay Cutler is. So, uh, again, you can question leadership all day long. Uh, I honestly don't have a problem with it. I've seen several different types of leadership styles, and you, whatever it takes to get everything going. Uh, if he had not gotten his butt kicked for years by the same guys on that offensive line uh and this was another year where they had high hopes then maybe i would say whoa 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 but you know i've seen colors uh, defend those guys time and time and time and time and time again so hey if if you're gonna blow every now and now and then so what i mean so their cameras caught it big deal that that is what it is i focus on winning and losing i'm not going to focus on the histrionics i'm not going to uh, uh say jay cutler's on the way out or lovey smith's going to be fired or a change needs to be made or this that or the other all these things that everybody said but everyone's entitled to their opinion so anyway including Bill Cowher, as I see he was questioning it too. But you have to understand, those guys are on the outside looking in. Even us fans are on the outside looking in. So that's the way I see it. Moving along from Jay Cutler too, and I'm going to get back to Jay Cutler a little bit because I want to share some uh, other stuff that I'd, I, in case you didn't hear, I was mentioning before the show in the pre-production that I did a very extensive analysis of the uh, game tape here. Uh, and a word about the NFL 22 All-20. It appears that they have a very low resolution when they first publish the coaches film. And then kind of like YouTube, you have to wait a while for, for the higher resolutions to be uh, released. Because I noticed today in looking at the All-22 film, the resolution looked far better than it did right when they released the All-22 coaches film for the Bears game versus the Packers. I was disappointed i mean i couldn't even see you can't even make out any numbers let alone the camera operators on it but anyway i did a very extensive analysis focusing on the offense only and i was actually encouraged by what i saw i know you guys are gonna say what do you mean encouraged by when i go down to the details and i'm gonna share some of those notes with you guys uh, and why i'm encouraged about what i saw and, and kind of too 
Uh, I just, I'll, I'll save it for later. Let's just do it that way. That's what we call a tease. Now, talking about Forte's injury, interesting to hear Lovey Smith say today that despite what Adam Schefter reported and all the media had had kind of re-reported or ran with or what have you, I mean, Schefter's a pretty legitimate source, so I could see why everybody would just assume what he said is true. Uh, but Lovey Smith countered that opinion, saying that, you know, Forte does not have a high ankle sprain. And also that a lot of media were reporting, if you looked at their tweets earlier today, that Matt Forte seemed to be all right, didn't even have a limp or a brace as he sprinted off the practice field, running away from the reporters. No comment, no comment, no comment. You know, plead the fifth, if you will. I played the fifth. But anyway, so... Uh, I'm not surprised that the Bears actually did go after Khalil Bell. I think it's a smart move. They never really wanted to let him go. I thought they might let him go just because he was questionable in his blocking and because of the salary that they were paying him and because I didn't think they would want to have a lot of snaps left over. There's no game plan to rotate in the third string running back, okay? So, uh, but it is very smart of them to bring him in. He knows the offense. He didn't get a job by anybody else, so I'm glad they brought him in. I don't just assume that Forte's injury's got to be pretty bad just because they brought in Khalil Bell. You have to look at the other side of it. They handed the ball off one carry to Armando Allen on his first carry stuffed up the middle. Okay, so I think that's what they're thinking is, oh boy, we need a Khalil Bell for when we need a Khalil Bell. And I'm sure all fans should be at least feel much more comfortable with having a Khalil Bell back there should we get to, into this situation again. Forte is likely not going to be active this week. I wouldn't be surprised at all. Uh, he didn't practice today. That's what the reports are coming out of Hallis Hall were. So Khalil Bell will see his carries this week, if you will. But I'd, I'd be much happier, actually, with Khalil Bell in, from a running game's perspective, having him active uh, over on an, uh, an Armando Allen sp uh, specifically. Booker I would have been cool with because I think Booker was the better runner between Booker and Allen. But Booker's on IR now, and they can't bring him back. A lot of people saying, well, why don't they? They can't bring him back anytime soon is more what I mean. So I think Forte, if at most, he might miss one or two games. I think at most he misses this one game. That's it. Uh, if he was running off the field with no limp, wasn't wearing an ankle brace, isn't a high ankle sprain, don't forget that one of the, the, the negatives of having that short week is not a lot of time to prepare, but there's a positive on the flip side of that, and that's having a more ample time to prepare uh, for the next game so he gets extra time to heal. And I hear the tweets coming in. Again, you can send them to at your boy if you want. Uh, send them to CFT Bears. Also, follow the chat along. This is the official chat hashtag of Chicago Football Talk, CFT Bears. And I took the widget off of the homepage for now just because I don't have time to moderate it. And if people can't be respectful on there, if they want to start jumping at each other's throats, then I'm just going to have to take it off for because uh, there's too much to risk to just put it on there and let some, you know, freewheeling yokel get all, get everybody all riled up by putting a stick in the, uh, at the hornet's nest, if you will. So, but you can follow along the conversation at CFT Bears. That's where I prefer. That's the questions I will be answering first at CFT Bears, not at your boy Roy. And that way you can see what everyone is uh, communicating and, and how everyone's chatting, what questions are already being asked. But you know me, I am going to try to get, I am sensitive to Monday Night Football too. I know it's right around the corner. So we will be making this show accelerated and hurrying things up as we move forward. So I'm happy they brought back Cleo Bell and we move along from that subject. I want to talk about the move, the other move that was made, and that would be Shiloh Rochelle uh, being starting for Chris Spencer. Chris Spencer apparently was told Saturday he was benched, according to Brad Biggs of the Chicago Tribune. Now, Chris Spencer actually did make more mistakes. This is this is going to segue, allow me to segue into what I noticed while looking at the offensive game tape. Very extensively, I might add, also, too. Uh, Chris Spencer, you know, you might remember Jamarcus Webb had a false start shortly after he actually let Cutler get his butt kicked. Uh, when I put that tweet out there, take a picture camera, girl. People seem to get a kick out of that one. Uh, and, and Jamarcus Webb, you might want to, you might want to control camera, girl. I mean, some of the tweets she's putting out on your behalf, I assume it's her uh, via your Twitter account and Facebook. I mean, settle it down. You didn't play the best game of your life either. Now you want people to buy your shirts after a game like that? Come on now. You might want to bite thy tongue for at least a week, my friend. And I know I got to assume I'm going to give him credit and the benefit of the doubt and assume that was camera girl. But I, I be camera girl. You need to put a lens cap on that on that shutter, if you will. <laughs> but anyway, 
Chris Spencer, actually, one of the main things that I noticed from the very first play of the game, and that's going to be one of the games that I uh, plays that I break down in YouTube, and I'm going to try to do it tonight. So you might see it a little late night post. The people across the pond are probably going to get first dibs as you guys go nighty night. But uh, Chris Spencer, actually, on the very first play that Matt Forte, when, when the uh, DJ Smith, I believe it was, the linebacker actually came. It was a quite a creative play that they had there, and I'll break it down more elaborately on YouTube. But uh, DJ Smith ended up coming through the hole. And what I noticed is, assuming they were in a zone blocking prote pass protection scheme again, BJ Raji actually uh, was going to stunt on that play. And he lined up between the center and the guard, between Roberto Garza and Chris Spencer. And uh, Chris Spencer let himself get confused. See, they haven't had a lot of chemistry to work out some of these kinks when they do twists. Stunts and twists end up hurting the Bears' offensive line. And it hurt them in that game from the very first play. He ends up being too occupied with where B.J. Raji's going, and B.J. Raji ends up crashing down on the center, Roberto Garza, that he basically creates a huge gap, too much space between him and Jamarcus Webb. He ends up opening the dam to allow D.J. Smith to come through. And technically speaking, I would have to assume that Chris Spencer actually had the first shot at blocking that guy before Matt Forte should ever have had to engage him. Now, another guy ends up coming through that hole. The other, I think it was Pickett who was twisting and stunning on that play. And shout, uh, Chris Spencer ended up picking him up. Uh, so Phil ended up moving, sliding over to fill that hole to pick that guy up. But even if you look at Matt Forte, and I'm not taking any heat off of Matt Forte, he looks surprised to have had to be blocking a guy so soon. Now, he, he turned his shoulders, which is what made it a bad block, but... Chris Spencer on that very first play, I think, was actually more uh, as much at fault. I'll say it that way because no one's more at fault. That Forte had the shot, unfortunately, once Spencer created the gap of Rohan and, and didn't move over to block uh, DJ Smith. But I truly believe that was supposed to be Chris Spencer blocking that guy first. And then the linebacker should have came in or the uh, a twisting guard would have been left for Matt Forte. But anyway, another thing that I noticed other plays, there were a couple false starts to get back to a Jamarcus Webb's false start. And also Kellen Davis had a false start. Those false starts were actually caused by Chris Spencer. I know it seems weird for you guys to say this and you might say, oh man, kick a guy while he's down, right? But honestly, uh, that was something I was going to put out in my YouTube video before I found out about. I'm not surprised he got benched. The thing was... You remember that one delay a game that was also caused by Chris Spencer. And then he also had the uh, sack of Clay Matthews that was directly uh, his fault when he lost control of Matthews. So he was responsible for at least five negative plays on his own. Uh, but on the false start, the delay of game that cut where Cutler wanted the snap and he ended up yelling at Chris Spencer off the sidelines, another lineman he yelled at, it was because... Uh, Cutler saw that the game clock was dwindling down and he basically gave him the signal where he lifts his leg up to snap the ball and Chris Spencer all nonchalantly turned over, waited for a half second, waited for Roberto Garza to finish calling off uh, uh, line checks at the line of scrimmage and then tapped him. By then it was too late. That's why Cutler was really, really pissed. Uh, but, but the other reason, the other two false starts that I mentioned by Jamarcus Webb and by Kellen Davis, if you look at Chris Spencer he ends up bobbing his head. Every, it was another one of those shotgun snaps where he's looking back at Jay Cutler, and then he turns around, and, and, he, and he's like bobbing his head as he's tapping Roberto Garza. And every time after he's bobbing his head and moving his hand in the ground, that's when you see Jamarcus Webb jump, and then on the other one when he's bobbing his head, you see Kellen Davis jump. Both of those plays, go back and look at them. Those false starts, very easy to find. If you have NFL Rewind or the game books, you can look in the game logs and look for when those penalties were called, and you will notice what I noticed. Put it on frame by frame, and you will see Chris Spencer's extra histrionics to try to dry the defensive uh, lineman offsides end up backfiring and drawing his own teammates offsides. Now, in defense, you're supposed to look at the ball. You're always taught, look down the line of scrimmage at the ball. Look at the ball or look at the man across from you. That's why they have that penalty. You know, if the offensive line guy made a move and you come across and it's on the offensive line. Uh, on the offensive line, though, you're, you're not looking down at the ball. You're basically looking at your teammate next to you. And so Kellen Davis, you know, he's not going to go all the way down and look at the ball of scrimmage, our line of, the ball at the line of scrimmage that Roberto Garza has in his hands. And neither did Jamarcus Webb, who was actually off to the back a little bit, you know, offset off the line of scrimmage just a little bit as he was pass blocking in the shotgun formation. So you see your teammate twitch like that. And, of course, it's only natural that you're going to jump. So I honestly, as I was watching that, I was like, my goodness, Chris Spencer, please. Enough with the head bobbing already. You're getting your teammates to jump offside. So 
Not surprised that he got benched. Now, another word about that whole benching. Uh, a lot of people are probably happy about the fact that he got benched and they needed to make a change somewhere. Uh, granted, he wasn't getting the snap count off the right way, but I don't expect Shiloh Rochelle to do much better, honestly, unless he's improved greatly while they've had him in practice. And granted, he hasn't been here as long as Chris Spencer, but I still think Chris Spencer is the better pass blocker. I think Shiloh Rochelle is probably the better run blocker. Uh, and, and he's more physical in a run blocking format, but it's going to be real interesting to see. I, I had him about equal, but I had Shiloh Rashal ahead of him because he was better in pass uh, blocking. The, the difference between their pass blocking was more significant than the difference between the, the running uh, differential in order to make up for that and make it equal. So I don't expect a whole ton of improvement, but hey, Shiloh Rashal, here's your opportunity. Here's your shot. You wanted it. You got it. Let's see what he does. So, but again, Chris Spencer made a lot more mistakes than he's even got credit for by the fans or by any of the media either, and it's in the tape. And, and I might get a chance to get into some of that and show you guys some of that. So I see the clocks ticking. I see Monday Night Football's coming around the corner. Don't worry, I'm sensitive. Again, send your tweets to at CFT Bears. Uh, also at uh, at your boy Roy as well. Of course, you can always send them there, and I will throw that up in case you, for whatever reason, don't know the Twitter handle at your boy Roy or CFT Bears is preferred because that is where I will be answering them first because it allows everybody to see the tweets together. Now, before I start taking your tweets, I'm going to take a sip and then I'm going to get into my offensive notes that I saw from very extensively breaking down the game. And this will be the first time I've communicated them anywhere. I didn't want to get on Twitter and start tweeting a stream of all these things I saw. I have my mediums to do that with and that will be on YouTube. I don't need to tweet, you know, live as I'm breaking down games that happened days ago. Anyway, cheers. Mm, mm, mm. Again, if you missed it, Southern Tier, who makes the best chocolate stout in the world, 2X IPA, their double IPA, and it is a big boy beer, brewed with four hops and three malts, 8.2%. How you like me now? So what I noticed about the offensive line, which actually encourages me, is that a lot of people gave Mike Tice criticism and a lot of heat for this game, and rightfully so. They were asking uh, where uh, I had fans tweeting me, asking me how come Cutler didn't throw to the hot routes or the the the. Uh, I, there weren't a lot of hot routes out there actually being ran in the game plan. I was looking at them. There's not a lot of flat routes where he could have just threw it short. A couple times there were, and he did it there, but there weren't actually a lot of those hot routes into the plays that I noticed, which was. Kind of unfortunate that you can give Mike Tice a, a heat for, if you will. But one thing I noticed is I was watching the first half of the game. And again, Matt Bowen did a good job. Uh, also, Mike Mayock during the broadcast did a very good job of describing the type of defense that they were running. But I actually really, really studied it and noticed the wrinkles that they were putting into that defense, that being the Packers defense. Not only were they doing two man uh, with two deep, two deep safeties uh, covering each half of the field and then two corners covering the short shallow half to allow the DBs to place the short routes, but Tremont Williams ended up following Brandon Marshall wherever he went. It wasn't so much a one side or the, but they always had two corners on either side of the field. Even in that first snap, when the Bears have two wide receivers on the uh, left side of the field, and I believe it was the uh, we, it was the weak side, but I believe it was also the wide side of the field, they still left a corner, and I believe it was Sam Shields, on the other side of the field, even though there was no wide receiver over there. They had two wide tight ends, but he wasn't even guarding those guys. He wasn't up on the line of scrimmage guarding the uh, other. He was guarding nobody, basically. So that told me right away they're in some kind of special defense where they're basically going to protect each half of the field in case somebody comes out. Uh, but, I, but yes, Tremont Williams ended up following Brandon Marshall wherever he went as long as he was on the outside. And so as I started to pick up on this pattern, I'm thinking, move Marshall to the inside for the love of all goodness. The reason that Charles Woodson was at safety and Tremont Williams is guarding Brandon Marshall wherever he goes on the field, except for when he's on the inside, is because Tremont Williams is their best corner now. They didn't want Charles Woodson to ever be matched up on Brandon Marshall. The one play, if I'm not mistaken, it happened twice where they actually moved him on, on the inside. It happened several times and a couple other times when they had five or six DBs on the field, not just when they had four, but when they had five or six DBs on the field, that when, when they moved Marshall in on the inside in the second half, that's when they started to do it. In the second half, uh, Ty started to move Marshall to the inside and then Woodson would end up covering Brandon Marshall on the inside if they only had four DBs on the field. 
But whenever they went to like their nickel or their dime where they had five or six DBs, then it wasn't Woodson who was covering them. So he had an even better matchup. But the, the, the line just couldn't hold up to allow Jay to ever have any time to get the ball. But the one time that, that they threw that wide open pass to Brandon Marshall, that uh, where it should have been a touchdown if he would have caught it. Even Brandon Marshall failed Jay Cutler that day. Uh, he was lined up on the inside. And there was another play, too, that Brandon Marshall, I thought, should have uh, caught the ball on. And he was lined up on the inside. So that's a matchup they definitely should have exploited. It's something I expect them to do uh, when they meet again. Now, granted, the Packers are probably going to do some wrinkles to their defense the second time. We can't expect... I mean, it's going to be 50-50. I still think they're going to make some changes, though they might say, you know what, that defense works so well, we're running it again until they prove they can stop us. But if they look at the second half, that tape was a tale of two halves, and in the second half, the Bears did make the adjustments they should have made a little bit earlier, which was moving Brandon Marshall on the inside on obvious running downs to uh, force Woodson to have to cover him. So there's a couple other plays I'm going to show you. I definitely one play that first play of the game. I'm going to break it down for a few different reasons uh, later on tonight so you guys can get a good look at it. And I think you'll be surprised by some other things that I saw in that one play there. But that was one of the biggest adjustments I thought they could have made. Also, of course, more rollouts. I know a lot of people wanted to see rollouts. We supposedly have it in our package. That's definitely something we should have had in there. So that uh, uh, Tice did make the necessary adjustments. It was a little bit late. He didn't do a lot of hot routes, but he did end up putting Brandon Marshall in on the inside, and it did end up working. However, it, it was a little bit too late, and again, it still couldn't overcome whatever offensive line woes the Bears had as protection was just piss poor that day and moving right along to uh the offensive woes uh, people want to know there who do i blame this on people ask me where's the percentage you know i'm tired of cutler getting all the wrong i'm tired of cutler getting none of the wrong it was all color fault none of it was Cutler's fault uh the answer is somewhere in between cutler definitely had a hand in this he, he was the quarterback i don't blame him as much for the interceptions as a lot of people did i went back and looked at the interceptions even that he had a couple of other near interceptions too there's one play where i really put all on color and it was was for missing a wide open Alshon Jeffrey when he had single coverage and I believe Mike Mayak pointed it out as well uh, but that was one of the most obvious plays where I actually blame Jay Culler a lot of people gave Culler heat for holding on to the ball a little too long and I could see it uh, where why people would think that honestly uh, I I'm not going to be that critical of him for holding on to the ball too long because one thing they had nobody to throw to and the reason that he's holding on to the ball and you can see it he starts to scramble. He tries to get something out of nothing. A couple of plays in that game, there was one play specifically where the, uh, there was great coverage and he ended up scrambling because the linemen actually did hold their blocks and he ended up scrambling and getting a first down, which allowed him to move the chains. But by the time, basically, uh, we could be critical of Cutler for holding on to the ball too long, it's already so late in the game and they are bas he's basically trying to get them going. So what I saw was great coverage by the Packers and Cutler basically trying to dodge bullets and scramble to get yards. The problem was the offensive linemen were not holding onto their blocks. And, and Jay Culler only threw the ball away once in that game. Could he have thrown it away more? Sure. But what he was doing, and this is all I'm trying to say to keep it in perspective, what he was doing when he was holding onto the ball too long was actually going, uh, attempting to scramble to try to get part, uh, positive yards. Because there were lanes, but eventually then, as he would step up into that lane, he'd look to his left, and there would be Clay Matthews because Jamarcus Webb didn't hold the block long enough. Or at Lance Lewis, who, who didn't have a perfect game either. He didn't allow any hurries or hits or whatever, but he he actually did not hold on to some blocks when the thing is the offensive line needs to hold on to their blocks longer let's just put it that way jay cutler is a quarterback who's going to scramble who's mobile who has led who's athletic who's not going to give up on a play very easily we saw that last night if you watched uh pittsburgh game two in the chicago area of the afternoon game where Ben Roethlisberger's uh, shaking and jiving and moving. That's how he plays. And he's ended up making positive yards on those plays. And Culler was trying to do the same thing. So uh, I'm not absolving him of holding on to the ball too long. I'm just explaining to you what he was trying to doing when he was holding on to the ball. Instead of getting rid of it, he said, I'm going to try to get some yards. But the offensive linemen were not holding on to their blocks long enough. And they need to continue to play through the whistle so they can give their quarterback a chance to salvage plays. Okay, I'd rather see him try to do that, honestly. I mean, there was points in the game where when there was four minutes left in the game, then he shouldn't be doing that. He should be getting rid of the ball, especially because the Bears were down a timeout. But I will never blame an athletic or mobile quarterback for trying to get extra yards if 
a lineman does not hold on to their blocks. All right, so that's all I'd like to say about that. But yes, again, the offense, there were everybody failed on that. Uh, Cutler tried to do a little bit too much at the end of the game uh, when he should have just realized the offensive line wasn't going to hold. The wide receivers, Brandon Marshall, failed him, dropping passes. Kellen Davis can't stay on his feet, dropping passes. And also very, very poor in, in blocking uh, from a on some of the pass rushes where Jay Cutler ends up uh, wanting to blitz, or, or I'm sorry, scramble on the right side. Kellen Davis lets go of his passing block, and that guy ends up tackling him. Devin Hester drops balls when when after Cutler needed him there, and he scrambled to make a play. So I'm not very happy. It was a total offensive failure. And again, also too, I could do a video to break down every one of Cutler's interceptions and near interceptions. But if you look at a lot of those plays too, there's plays where the one interception that was totally on him. He's he's really launching back. And he's trying to throw a pass 60 yards downfield. Now, the thing is, right when he sees that Brandon Marshall's open to do it and he wants to launch that bomb, he sees, I believe it was Eric Walden coming clean through on him. So he knows he's going to take a hit. But And it did not allow Cutler to step up into the ball. But if you actually do look at those interceptions, you will see that on uh, most of those interceptions that he's throwing, even the near interceptions, Yes, he was throwing off his back foot, but when you've got guys coming at you and you can't step up into the pass, that's going to happen. So I'm not explaining away the interceptions. He's still the guy that threw the ball, but you have to look at the whole play. Linemen aren't blocking, and that is easily going to, when you don't keep a, let me just go back to this, all right, and then we'll finish that up and we're going to get onto your tweets here. If you look at the, the touchdown pass to Kellen Davis, there was a few other passes, too, and the rifle shot that he threw to, to Earl Bennett, where Earl Bennett was drifting back on the ball. That was one of his interceptions. Cutler held onto the ball too long, scrambled out of the pocket, made a play, found Earl Bennett, fired a rifle to Earl Bennett, and Earl Bennett waited for the ball to come to him, and he ended up taking three steps back waiting for the ball to come to him, which allowed the DB, who was three yards behind him, to run past Earl Bennett to catch the ball. Everybody knows you got to come back to the quarterback, especially in those types of situations. So that's just one of the examples. But what really clued me into it, which is why I dug real deeply into the tape, is look at the touchdown pass that, that Jay Culler had to Kellen Davis. This is late in the game after he's already been beaten up like a piñata throughout the whole game. The offensive line does a perfect job, probably the best job they did the whole game in holding the pocket and giving him protection. He had ample room to step up and throw, and he made a perfect pass. And he made it look easy, too. I mean, when you see him throw that pass, go back and look at that pass. And look, if you looked at just that play and you started watching the game from that play forward, you go, my God, the pocket's there and he's throwing a beautiful ball. Why are they down? So he still held his composure and poise enough. And even if you gave him a pocket late into the game, he was able to make a perfect throw. All those other plays, he's under duress. He's got no pocket. He's got no room to step up. And he's forced to throw it off his back foot. All right. So, I mean, he could have just ate it, sat there and let himself get sacked. But I, I honestly, again, I looked at it very detailed with a fine tooth comb. And I was looking, are, is the pocket held when he's making these picks or is, are guys coming at him two steps away from coming at him? And that's what you saw, guys, two steps away from coming at him. Cutler seeing him in his eye and him having no choice but to throw it off his back foot if he wanted to get the ball off. OK, so again, uh, maybe he shouldn't be throwing with the ball off his back foot and he should just take the sack, I guess you could say. But it, just take a look at all the factors before you start to be put your final judgment in is all I'm saying, my friend. So come to my favorite part of the show. I see Monday Night Football is about to kick off in nine minutes. So we need to get to your tweets and go through them as fast as we can. I know you guys probably your fantasy victory is coming down to the wire here in this game right now. So let's get to your tweets and we will start with. Uh, CFT Bears, as I said that we would. And I'm sure we've gotten all kinds of text uh, messages here. Pound CFT Bears on Twitter is the official hashtag of Chicago Bears. And the first tweet of the day is going to Jake. Let me get the hashtag off there. And I will also get to the at your boy Rory tweets. Jake Proxis one on says against two man, the Bears need to run earlier. Also, I would like to see Marshall in the slot with Hester and, and, and Jeffrey drawing safeties. Absolutely. Again, when I was looking at that play, I kept saying, OK, well, they're following Tremont Williams is following Brandon Marshall all over the field unless he's lined up on the inside. More of that, please. They did not want Woodson on him. They didn't want any other corner on him ever at all. 
And and the one play where the where Woodson, I think it was Woodson who was actually guarding Marshall on that play when he was lined up on the inside. Uh, he he should have had a touchdown. And there's another play too that. But I'm gonna break some of that down so you'll see it in YouTube. I know it's just words. Picture speaks a thousand words. I'm gonna put some pictures of the words so you guys can take a look and see what's going on. Kaiser Soze says, I love you, DJ Moore, but shut the hell up. Enough with this non-story. Cutler was right to chew on Jamarcus Webb. Try to motivate him somehow. Again, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. I'm not going to say one way or another who's right and who's wrong in it. There's different leadership styles, different strokes for different folks. Ask any parent who has multiple children who aren't, tw- even if they are twins. My brother, I got twin nieces, okay? My brother and my sister, they have to talk, sister-in-law have to talk to them differently, okay? And they're twins. So everybody, it takes different ways to communicate to, to different people. And that's twins. And that's every time you see studies done on, you know, tabula rosa or the clean slate or where twins would go and this, that, or that, you use twin. I just gave you a twin study, all right? Live on Chicago Football Talk with your boy Roy here. Jameis says, my man, you got to tell us sooner when you have a show, for real. Uh, yes, absolutely. And Jameis says, enough about color. It's not week three. Stop, please. Yes, absolutely. Again, uh, I'm not worried about it. Again, I'm not at all. I just have not yet had a chance to express some of the opinions that I know people had been asking me for. As such, I took the time to do it here on the show, uh, live here, and I've definitely put it to bed. I'm going to do a couple of breakdown plays, and I can't wait to dive into the Rams tape. And that Rams game is not going to be an easy game, by the way. Don't sleep on those Rams. That defense is something I'm nervous about. I said it in my breakdown video. They're not going to be a pushover. And then look what we saw yesterday, right? Uh, uh, Had that almost came back uh, on the – or I'm sorry, did come back and beat the Redskins. And also almost had beat the Detroit Lions, too. So that's going to be, that is not going to be just a pushover game. When uh, when media and fans and everything, oh, a good thing we got the Rams. I was like, be careful what you wish for. Uh, Jeff Fisher is a defensive beast. All Bears 1052 says, FYI, uh, for another displaced Bears fans, NFL ticket available on PS3 for download. No direct TV needed. Woohoo, bear down. PSA from All Bears 1, 1052, and we always try to help each other out here. Big Hurt NYC says, was Tice's offense to blame for the overzealous play calls, or was Jay's ego the main factor? Well, you know what? We never did get an audible count to find out how often Jay Cutler audibled in this game. Uh, honestly, I think it just came down to protection. Uh, you could, I would probably have to put it on Tice first, and I'll get into that a little bit. That first play... People have alluded to on that very first play they were going for the home run ball. They were. And I'll explain that in my video later tonight. Uh, If you if you miss it tonight, you can expect to see it tomorrow for sure. Uh, Tice and don't forget, Tice wants to run an explosive offense. I already broke down that blog for you. They had 13 explosive plays. By the way, Tice measures them last week. This week they only had uh, I I had it written down here. I think I want to say four or three. They had three explosive plays, two passes and run, one run. And eight is the magic number. And by golly, I believe eight is what the Packers had, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, they did. They had seven passes and one run. Packers hit the magic number. Bears didn't. I think maybe Tice might get a little over anxious in trying to hit those explosive plays, hit those home runs, because he knows about his magic number. If I could just get eight, then our chances of winning goes up. Just like Lovey Smith, if I can just get four turnovers, then, our, then if the offense makes two, we'll still be plus two. Uh, but yes, I think part of it is on Mike Tice. I would have to say more of it was on Tice than Jay's ego, per se. Uh, they never went, they barely had a chance to go no huddle at all there. So I don't believe Jay was calling plays. Uh, and if he was, it was not for a majority of the time. I think they had one two minute drive at the end of the first half where he would have had an opportunity to do so. But all those other play calls, you have to assume were Mike Tice. Uh, if anything, again, I think he didn't adjust to putting Marshall on the inside of the slot uh, sooner than he should have. When they went to running the ball, everything went good, and then they had a penalty. I believe that's when they were running the ball well with Michael Bush. They made the adjustment that they needed to make. And I look, I'm looking at the drive chart right here, and that's when Gabe Karimi ended up uh, getting his uh, under, unnecessary roughness right here. Michael Bush up the middle, seven yards. Michael Bush up the middle, two yards, third and one. Michael Bush uh, up the middle, three yards. Right tackle, three yards. First down. Michael Bush up the middle, four yards. Second and six. Jay Cutler short pass to Earl Bennett for 10 yards. First and 10. Michael Bush for minus one yards. Unnecessary roughness on Karimi. Second and 26. 
How many plays in the playbook do we have for second and 26 on a night when the offensive line is already? So that put him in an obvious passing down right there. And Jay Cutler got sacked. That was the play when they finally had something gotten going. Okay, this is their, uh, I want to say their fourth drive of the game. First, second, third. Yeah, their fourth drive of the game after having three three and outs on their fourth drive of the game. They finally get something going when they run the ball with Michael Bush and Karimi brain farts and then Cutler. Has it, or Webb has his infamous play that led to the infamous shove, the shove heard around the world by Jay Cutler and Jamarcus Webb. So, again, I'd be pretty ticked off about that, too. That put him from second and 26 to third and 33. Two offensive line mistakes in a row. And uh, third and 33, you're not going to do anything with third and 33. A enter fourth and 26 and enter Adam Podlesh, okay? So, <coughs> pardon me. Moving right along, Lauren Cox, I hope that didn't blow your speaker, says, do you think Spencer struggled because he switched from right guard to left? Well, Rashal faced the same problem. Well, in Brad Biggs' article, he talks, uh, Rashal talks about how he feels like he, because he is left-handed, that he should be more comfortable on the left side of the ball with the, than the right side of the ball. I think it comes down more to timing. Uh, Rashal in the offensive line needs time to gel. He knows, he got used to having Lewis on the right and Garza on the left. Now he's on the left side where he's got Webb on the left and Garza on his right. Things are different on the other side of the line. He feels he's more comfortable with his hands, but he still has to get communication down with Webb and with Garza from a left-handed side of the perspective. But the big mistake, I think the reason he ended up getting benched is not because he gave up that sack to Clay Matthews so much. Go back and look at when they're in the shotgun and when Spencer has to tap uh, Garza, he caused one delay a game and two false starts. He caused those. That's three bad plays right there. So I think that had, if he didn't have those three plays, we'd still be seeing Chris Spencer in here. Cause then he only, I mean, there was a couple other plays, but that first play, like I mentioned, a lot of people put it all on Forte and it wasn't just all Forte. I, I have a very strong feeling that guy came right through Gar, uh, Spencer's way. He left too much room of a gap between Webb and, and I'm going to show you guys later on YouTube. You'll see, I'm going to show you, but anyway, moving right along. Jameis says, uh, best line me and my fellow fan uh, in the flesh came up with. This is a trap game. They want us to think Davis has value. Meet tweet. And uh, he's probably talking about Kellen Davis, I would say. Jameis chimes in and says, hate to say it, but Brandon Marshall's drop touchdown was the turning point. For real. Absolutely it was. Well, you know what? As I take a sip of my beer to refresh there, hope everyone has their libations handy. That play basically told you if you were to read the intangibles that play right there lets you know they were not going to win the game no matter what happened they they basically had one good foot left after shooting the right foot and shooting every toe in the big toe the list little toe went to the market and shot the big toe too on the right foot they had one big toe left they had their pinky left on the left toe and when brandon marshall dropped that touchdown basically blasted the pinky off of the off the big toe so, uh, yes, that, that just told you things were not going the Bears' way. Again, it's only one loss, so it's better early on in the season. They've got a lot of room to grow. Uh, I, you, would, you should expect to see an inconsistent offense out of these Bears until the offensive line gels. And now they're already starting to shuffle the deck, so it's going to take a while. I mean, again, uh, these systems are not built overnight. Offensive lines take time to gel. Moving right along, Jameis says, I don't care, bench Webb and Kellen Davis. And Kevin McAllister says, I'm beginning to think Cutler will never lead us to a Super Bowl. Serious doubts. Again, they, and that's Kevin McAllister, and I will not be uh, telling anyone what they should and shouldn't think. I'm not surprised that tons of fans, tons of fans, even fans that write for the blog here, Kevin McAllister, are basically uh, holding out all doubts or not holding out all doubts, but basically are on that side of the ledger now. They're basically, you know what, uh, or at that side of the fence, I should say. We're not doing any accounting here. Uh, a lot of fans don't have faith. This is nothing new in Chicagoland. And if there's one thing Chicagoans and Bears fans are good at, it's questioning the play of their quarterback and, and putting everything. The quarterback gets all the heat. And they get all the credit, too, when they do good. I mean, but my what a difference one game can make. Not even four days before that game, everyone's talking this guy is MVP or going to set records. Not MVP, but, you know, he could have a great year this year. And, uh, again, you got to go to everybody who is really, really worried. To everybody who is very, very concerned. I recommend, if you have time or the stomach to, 
go back and look at that game and try to be objective. Not with this thought already in your mind that Jay Cutler sucks, that he was holding on to the ball too long, that you're questioning his leadership abilities, that you think the whole uh, game was his fault. Look at the bad throws he makes and see if any line defensive lineman has broken through the dam and on their way to the quarterback. The quarterback sees that, okay? These throws where he's on his – just go back and look. I did it, and I tell you I felt great about what I saw. When I looked at the tape, it, I was reaffirmed in what I thought I saw the first time, and I went through it with a – it took me four hours, and all I did was look at the offense. Playback, playback, play. Oh, I paused it frame. Again, 60 frames a second. And I'd see two linemen coming his way when he throws it off his back foot quickly. And you can see him, like, flinch a little bit to get rid of the ball as quickly as possible. And look at when he had a clean pocket. As late as the – whenever that touchdown was, I think that was in the fourth quarter when the Bears finally scored that Kellen Davis play. Late third quarter or fourth quarter. Look at how beautiful of a throw that was, how easy he made it look. Go back and look at the interception to Earl Bennett. Jay Cutler holds onto the ball too long, scrambles left, and gets killed. And I believe that was Eric Walden, but somebody just runs up to him and, and basically gives him a killer shot in the gut. He still fires a rope to Earl Bennett, who should have came back to the ball. And Mike Mayock does a great job of pointing that out, too. He's moving three or four yards back, when the, and, and the Green Bay defender comes from behind him to make that play. Put Alshon Jeffrey. This is the thing that you guys have to understand, too. The Bears are going through growing pains. They know Earl Bennett more than they know Alshon Jeffrey. And I told you guys this in the preseason uh, when, when we were talking about should Alshon Jeffrey start. And I did it on like two shows ago before the season started that they need, they're going to need to make him start sooner rather than later. Because all it takes is one play where somebody doesn't deliver all the way. And you want your best in on as many plays as possible. If that was Alshon Jeffrey that that ball was thrown to, you think he would have just sat there? I'm not saying he wouldn't have. Would have, could have, should have. He might have also stayed there and waited. But his body frame and his, you know, again, that's on tape now. So hopefully none of the Bears uh, players, after reviewing that and getting chewed out by Daryl Drake, that's what I said, that's what I said, uh, should be waiting for the ball to come to him. But that play right there. So, again, I appreciate the concerns and everyone expressing them and sharing them and the angst. But if you want to get de-angst and you want to get unangst, go back and look at the tape. It's real obvious. It's clear as day when you go back and look at the tape. If you do it objectively, if you can, if you can overlook, oh, you know what you've already thought and said, and just look, just take, pay attention. Those questionable throws. Go ahead and look at the line. All right, and see if anybody's coming through the dam. If the dam's already broken and water's coming down and he just sees it hasn't hit yet and then he just decides to throw with less mechanics than he should. And again, go back and look at the Kellen Davis play. Perfect. Makes it look easy. And that's after he got his butt kicked. And that's the best example I can continue to use for anybody that's worried about this situation. Big Herd NYC says, why not start the season strong with simpler plays, runs, short drops, and later shock defenses with explosive plays? You know, that's a good question. I think they thought they had the upper hand on Green Bay. They felt confident going in. They obviously felt confident in their game plan, but it's just a young offense. You're, you're, this is the kind of stuff you're going to expect to see. I had no, I thought the Bears very much, I mean, I called it out in my preview video that the Bears were going to try to run uh, pass to set up the run against Green Bay because Green Bay was going to do whatever they could to stop the run, which is what they basically tried to do, even though they were still in that uh, two, two deep, two man shell and they didn't have an eighth safety in the box. The the uh, other safety that was in the middle is still right behind the line of scrimmage, like technically just outside of the box by like about seven yards. So they were still playing close and still wanting to stop stop the run. But definitely they should have leaned on the run more. And when they did, they got it going. But then they had those penalties uh, by Karimi. Again, I pointed that out in the second quarter. And then on their next drive, this is the thing. After the Bears got it going on that drive in the second quarter, they didn't get the ball back until two minutes were left in the game. And this is something a lot of people do when they look at how many times did they pass versus they run. They take things out of context. The next drive after they got the ball going with the run, they had one minute and 50 seconds left on the clock. You're not going to run the ball when you have one minute and 50 seconds left on the clock. So you had to wait till the whole after halftime. And then that's when you get to the Bears going up the middle with Forte. Forte on the right end and then short middle. So they did make the adjustments they needed to make. It's just they couldn't help themselves from shooting themselves in the foot. And on their opening drive, they got a field goal after running the ball and moving to some more shorter passes. So 
Anyway, moving right along here, we've got plenty of tweets here. I'm going to transition so that you don't have to see all the nasty scrolling. Send the tweets to CFT Bears, preferably. Those are going to be the ones I get to first, as Monday Night Football is kicking off now, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-mm-mm. All right, I see T. Worth. We finally caught up here. It just gives me another excuse to drink my excellent beer, and I hope everyone's having a good time. Uh, I hope you're doing good on your fantasy leagues right now because I know Monday Night Football is kicking off, and we've got fantasy stuff that needs to be. You guys got uh, games you need to win, if you will. I've just left my fantasy team on auto coach, and I, I'm sure I probably owe it to right now. But maybe I'm undefeated in both of my leagues. T. Worth says, what up, Roy? Do you think there is any luck Chicago tries to pull a deal for some linemen? <laughs> LOL. I'm just saying. You know what? I think Brad Biggs put it best, or maybe it was Michael. I think it was Brad Biggs. And poor media, again, they get the angst from the fans because, I, I, like I tell you guys, the Brad Biggs, th- this should be the day and this week, this game, where fans are starting to realize the difference between what the media does and what fanalists and fan bloggers and so on and such like myself do. You know, we're the ones you guys need to talk to when you're crying and worrying and complaining and all that stuff. You know, not that we're experts and they're not either. You know, they're journalists. They're there to cover the team and give you news. So a lot of the stuff you're asking them, of course, they're going to get tired of hearing it. And, and uh, Brad Biggs put it best. Get back to me when uh, teams willing to trade away one of their starting offensive linemen. So that's kind of not, not to put it in the words that he did, because I'm sure he was getting kind of jaded by dealing with the fans. But. Adam Dyson says, problem number one, and I saw him tweet this to me at your boy Roy. This is Adam Dyson's synopsis in 140 characters or less. Problem one, not running the ball. Problem two, no screens and dumps. Problem three, they did run two screens. Uh, problem three, no Brandon Marshall in motion. Uh, yes, they did not do more. More specifically, no Brandon Marshall in the slot. If you're going to motion them, don't just motion them to the other side of the field. They needed to move them on the inside, like I said a few times. Problem number four, poor play from the wide receiver, quarterback, offensive line, left tackle, left tackle, left tackle, and the left tackle. <laughs> I didn't know we had that many left tackles. All of them suck. But, no, you forgot to mention the tight end also. And, no, again, no lineman was perfect. Roberto Garza, the best thing Roberto Garza did is he didn't put a shotgun snap on the ground, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe I've forgotten it, but I don't remember him putting a shotgun snap on the ground in the last game. So that's a good – maybe he did, though. Maybe I'm just – with everything whirlwind caught in the eye of the storm here. My girl, Squirtle, chimes in, G-Square 9. And I love that beautiful smile. Look at that pretty smile. Especially the running game, uh, talking about the Bears there and how they should have been able to use that to get things going. Aaron Reyes says, what did you think of my boy Erlacher? You know what? I have to agree with what a lot of people said. He kind of looked pretty slow on a few plays. He just didn't look like he had the lateral quickness. That one play where he almost had his Mike Singletary moment where he collided with, I believe it was Cedric Benson or one of their running backs uh, right at the line of scrimmage. Uh, I thought he held up well there. Now, hopefully he's still getting in shape. They're not going to just pull Erlacher, so we're going to have to wait and see on that one. And I did not look at the defense in my review with the fine tooth comb because I was very happy with what the defense did thrilled with what the defense did absolutely thrilled has green bay still in the tithy up to the north still worrying about aaron Rodgers. still wondering when he's going to return and actually quarterback that team the real aaron Rodgers. moving right along squirtle says i think dj was a hypocrite just for the fact that he did uh what jay he did to jay what jay did to webb uh you know what that's a good way of putting it absolutely uh because he basically and he even said i wouldn't call anybody out in the media you know, that's like calling somebody out in the media. And that's what exactly kind of what he did by answering that question. The thing is, you know, the media's job is to get those juicy quotes, to, not just to report the news, but to get juicy quotes, get the players to say something, get under their skin. That's why they repeatedly ask them some of the same dumb ass questions to try to hope that they uh, say something. They and that's why you hear Cutler say, I'm not going to fall for that one. I'm not going to go for that one. And uh, they know DJ Moore wears his heart on his sleeve. He's never going to lie. He keeps it real. And they asked him about it and he just opened up. So he, you know, even though he didn't realize he was taking it to the media, which is what he said, what Cutler did was similar to, uh, he basically was just being honest. And again, Everybody has an opinion on this, and I don't blame DJ Moore for having that opinion either. But again, he doesn't work with – he even said he doesn't even talk to Cut, so he doesn't even work, and I'm not surprised. Defensive teammates, 
it's a close knit group. And when they're in the meeting room in the film room, you know, they're they're meeting like back in the day when I played football in high school. Okay, everybody together watched football. You know, the film. Everybody together, the whole team. So everyone knew who was accountable for every because that's the guys played multiple positions, and we didn't have twenty different meeting rooms and twenty different film rooms. But in the pros, they break down that safeties are with each other, DBs are with each other, linemen are with each other, linebackers are with each other. There's not a lot of crossing and, and, and a chance, especially on different sides of the ball. So I'm not surprised that DJ Moore doesn't talk to Cutler. And I'm not surprised that DJ Moore felt that way about if Cutler were to do that to him. But I'll tell you right now, Cutler wouldn't do that to DJ Moore. And if he did, I would expect DJ Moore to react that way because Cutler would have no uh, uh, room or ground to stand on to criticize DJ Moore because he doesn't play defense. He's not on that side of the ball. He doesn't know how DJ Moore is in the uh, on the practice field in terms of in the meeting rooms as a DB. Okay, but what he does know is is Jamarcus Webb's tenor, Jamarcus Webb's attitude, Jamarcus Webb's motivation level, seriousness, how to communicate with him. Those guys know each other very well. So I'm not going to hold it against DJ for being critical, and I'm not going to hold it against Jay Cutler for being uh, doing what he thought was best to get under uh, Jamarcus Webb's skin, to, to get to motivate him, I should say. Kaiser Soze says, RD handled Rodgers. I think they can handle the Rams. I got to wonder if the Rams emulate what the pack defense did to our offense, though. Well, I can't wait to get into the Rams tape. Believe me. G Squirtle 9, my girl, chimes in and says, Webb deserved it. Do your job and you won't get yelled at. This is true. I mean, how many of us that work in the real world have had bosses that we just really don't care about or coworkers we just really don't care about? And uh, sometimes they've gotten after us even if we did or didn't do something wrong. And Jamarcus Webb clearly did do something wrong on that play. That's the thing. As Squirtle points out right here, right? It's not like Jamarcus Webb, you know, maybe missed an assignment or maybe that was supposed to be some other guy's guy. That was one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, that was him right then and there. So that was, you know, you can't, hey, just like I don't uh, blame people for hating on Cutler and for the heat that he's taking right now, I'm not going to blame Webb uh, for taking the heat he got from Cutler. He made that mistake. Just like Cutler made his bed by picking a fight with Webb, uh, Webb made his bed by, by making a mistake on that play. Lauren Cox says, how much influence does it appear that Bates has in the play calling? He was calling them in Denver when Pro Bowl was a, uh, Cutler was a Pro Bowler. I don't know, actually. Uh, I have no idea. I know that from what I gather from when you analyze Tice's comments, they all, and even just as recently on Bears Insider a couple weeks ago, they basically all get together and he takes input from them every week, all the positional coaches to come up with a game plan and then makes a game plan. I'm sure they talk a lot on the sidelines. I'm sure they talk a lot uh, at halftime to make adjustments. But Tice is calling those plays. Nobody else is calling those plays. The only – oh, let me put it this way. Jeremy Bates is calling every play. He's calling every play that Mike Tice tells him to call because Jeremy Bates is the guy relaying the call in, our, in Cutler's helmet. But Mike Tice is calling all those plays. Adam D Dyson says, call it like it is. Jamarcus Webb couldn't block Matthews on Facebook or on Twitter. Damn. Hey, well, it wouldn't be Jamarcus Webb. It would be Cameron Girl, but that's a very good one. Kudos to you on that one, my friend. You get a favorite. You get a star, a golden star by your Roy Roy, which means favorited. That was a good one. Cheers, everybody. I hope you're enjoying it. And I will let you go here so you can fully enjoy, get all your attention into the Monday Night Football game. I just want to finish these tweets here. Aaron Reyes says, the Bears signed a tight end. Davis here is Davis hearing footsteps in Emory We Trust. I mean, they signed Epps, and then he got signed to the Jets practice squad, and then they went and signed another. He better be hearing footsteps. Kellen Davis, and this is something Jim Miller really, I, I got to give credit to Jim Miller because it would be real easy for him, and I said this, I believe, on my YouTube breakdown, for him to just side with Kellen Davis because they both went to the same college, not at the same time, obviously, but, you know, Michigan State alum and so on and so forth and a bear. But Jim Miller has been one of the guys publicly as a Bears expert and analyst those are the experts like matt bowen jim miller the guys that play football that know what they're talking about okay uh those guys jim miller has been on kellen davis's butt okay more than i have well well not maybe not more than i've been i've been on it longer for sure but i give credit to jim miller for 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 not pulling any punches and for basically calling them out saying he's still waiting for him to play up to his frame six seven there were some plays in that game 
uh, one play where uh, basically he's running and it, and they should have called a, the refs actually played pretty called a bad, very bad game. They didn't even call holding except maybe once and it was against the Bears. Even though Pe- Peppers was getting held repeatedly and Melton was getting held repeatedly and Jamarcus Webb actually held on that first play. He held Clay Matthews and they could easily call that. I have a feeling they were reprimanded by the NFL though and saying, "Hey, you want to swallow those whistles because these games are going too long and this is a national TV game. We can't be giving away free advertising. This game needs to be three hours." Blah blah blah, and it wasn't, but um, but yeah, Kellen Davis on one play ends up getting out muscled when he's running a route to letting himself get bumped, and it's just uh, yeah, chip blocks too, barely putting a hand on. I'm glad Jim Miller's saying it because uh, even though Kellen Davis could avoid it for me, saying, Oh, what do I know what I'm talking about? I mean, I can look at tape and see when someone's being soft for sure, but he can't ignore it when Jim Miller's saying it. I mean, he could say, Well, that's just people on the outside looking in, but Jim Miller's looking too, tape don't lie. Warren Cox says uh, he was signed to the practice squad. He played defensive end in college, talking about the tight end. Special teamer for the Chiefs and Seahawks, not much tight end tape. Uh, It doesn't mean that he might not be a physical tight end blocker, but yes, I I wish I could see some tape of him. And like you said, there's not much to see. Jake chimes in again. Proxis one on says Bears did make some good adjustments when drives failed in a PF and a drop touchdown. Oh, penalty flags and a drop touchdown. But I feel like it took them a drive or two too long. Yes, absolutely. Like I said, they should have actually made uh, the adjustments, at, especially Marshall. That was an obvious adjustment. I noticed it after two drives. You watch the plays and I noticed it and I was like, okay, no matter where Brandon Marshall goes on the field, Tremont Williams is following him as their number one DB and they're playing that too deep doubling the outside but whenever he went in on the inside they did not move Tremont Williams to the inside assuming I guess the Packers that being the Packers that anytime they lined up with two receivers on the outside that those guys were still going to be the primary receiver that's when they needed to take advantage of the matchup but a lot of it is timing a couple plays where they moved him in Brandon Marshall drops the ball twice when he was moved in on the inside and also lack of protection or penalties so moving right along Squirtle says well, I don't like it, and Eli would never win a Super Bowl. Uh, stop jumping the gun. Very interesting. <laughs> Sorry about that. Kaiser Sosa says hologram Tupac can block. Uh, hologram Tupac can block better than Webb. Karimi played 49 of 52 college games at left tackle. Lovey said it was possible. That's interesting. It could be that that move ends up getting made. CFT Bear says Cutler and the offense will be fine. Just have a little patience, folks. It's a long season. That's probably one of the most uh, (laughs) logical tweets I've heard regarding the whole subject as well. Absolutely, man. Patience, please. It's a new offense. Offense always comes along slower than defense. Lauren Cox says, in my humble opinion, any more changes to the offensive line will decrease quality of play. This is true because they do need to gel. They need uh, continuity game to game to form consistency. This is very true. Again, I think it comes down to what he did at left guard, and maybe they're just saying, you know what, Rochelle is a natural guard. Let's just give him a shot. And they're trying to preach accountability, and maybe they're trying to also send a hidden message to Webb too, even though Ty said he doesn't believe in sending messages. Again, I talked about Spencer enough. I think it was it had more to do with also, too, the way he was doing those fake snap, the, the things and moving his head, getting his fellow offensive linemen and, and, uh, to move. I know you're bobbing your head. T. Worth says, I think until management takes a serious look at molding the uh, modifying the offensive line, it's going to be tough. They we knew this was a problem years ago. And you could very well be right, T. Worth, and I think a lot of Bears fans who feel the same way that they never made any moves on the offensive line. There's only so moves, you, so many moves you can make. I, I think a lot of people see now why it's so critical to get offensive linemen. It could be tough. You ve- you could very well be right. I mean, you can only shuffle the deck uh, deck chairs of the Titanic so often, but that ship's still going down, if you will. So uh, I hope that you're not right, if you will. Uh, but but like you said, you're not saying you know. We, we won't know. It's going to be tough, absolutely. And, and we're going to find out, though. But that definitely, they could end up being the Achilles heel. Squirtle says, 22 years of worthless quarterbacks, and we finally get one, and people are bitching. Very, very true. And you know what, Squirtle? I think you really hit the nail on the head, girl, is that people are jaded. They're still living in the past. They have nightmares of Rex Grossman when they wake up. You know, if you saw some of those Bears fans on the telecast and I was re-watching the game, those were the perfect. I mean, I love them. But they look like you can see that one guy who looks like the total meatball, dude, steaming in his Erlacher jersey in the end zone. 
I don't want any more sausage. Give me another beer. God damn cutler shit. Oh, pardon me. Pardon my French there, but man, it was just classics. But yeah, you're right. I think people are living in the past. They're not living in the moment, and they're also taking things out of their context. But it's hard to, to, to think about it when you're not looking at the tape very uh, thoroughly. And that's the thing. If you don't take time to look at the tape, and you're going to make uh, comments and, and worry about things and not look at the tape, oh, just, just keep it in perspective. Again, football players, coaches, and teams look at tape constantly because things happen too fast. So if you're worried and you haven't gone to the tape to try to ease your own worry, then I don't know what else will ease your worry. But I would recommend, at, let me be Dr. Phil right now, Dr. Football Phil, Dr. Pigskin Phil. If you're worried at night and you can't sleep, if you're ready to lose faith in color and you got one foot off the ledge and the other foot on a banana peel, settle down, take two steps back, crack open a libation of your choosing and watch the game again as objectively as possible Go frame by frame, go back and back and back. Make sure you look at the linemen, okay? When Cutler is throwing with bad mechanics, look at the linemen. Is there a defensive guy that's ready to hit Cutler when he makes this bad mechanical throw? And if the answer is yes, move along. You will feel better after you look at the tape, which is why I do it. Moving right along, Kevin McAllister says, I agree, number six didn't have much time, but if we can't block Green Bay, who can we block? Certainly not Detroit, Houston, or San Francisco. That is the game. People are starting to realize why I had that game circled on my calendar from back in April when the schedule first came out. 2-0 and looking really good doing it, too. Uh, embarrassing the NFC North that they stomp right through our division, right? Uh, going to be, this is the good thing about it. When you lose to your bitter rival as badly as it did and everything, things couldn't be any worse than they are right now. I mean, we can lose another game, but I mean, right now, at this moment, after two games, they couldn't be any worse than had we lost to the Colts, I guess. But uh, the, the swing of emotions, if you will. Now San Francisco's got beaten the NFC North twice, okay? Everyone in the division, one and one. We have to be working ourselves. What I want to see is the Bears getting better as the games progress. It's still so early on in the season. I want to see, pro as long as I see progress, that's all I care about. Now they've laid an egg on national TV. They've got things to clean up. They're making adjustments. We have to be waiting and gearing ourselves up for that game versus the 49ers. That is the game. If the Bears still manage to get control of this division, they won't have to worry about Detroit. They won't have to worry about Green Bay. The team they're going to have to worry about if they feel like they want to do anything in the playoffs is going to be San Francisco. And fortunately, the Bears don't play the San Francisco 49ers until, oh, when is that game? Until November 19th, okay? November 19th, another national game. November 19th is when the Bears have to make sure they're better by because that is the game right there. But very good comment by Kevin McAllister there. And Brandon Hookie chimes in and says the Packers had the best number and uh, had the Bears number and they didn't look like that far of a superior team. Clean it up. Move forward. The Bears. Absolutely. Wholeheartedly agree there. And we've got eight more tweets to read here on CFT Bears hashtag again. Take a look at and send me your tweets to CFT Bears. I'm going to finish these off and I will not get to the at your boy Roy tweets, but I will get to them after the show so that you at least get the attention that you deserve that I always want to give to you, my fellow Bears fans. And I see G uh, Squirtle here is there with the tweet. Our next tweet comes from G Square Nine says, and it's funny, Aaron Rodgers has been in the same system since Favre, and Jay has been in three different offenses. Absolutely, without a doubt, something people overlook. Hey, I'm not going to play the whole uh, female versus male card, but this is sounding like one of the most intelligent football fans out there, all right? Female, if you don't know, my girl G Square Nine, a lot of male Bears fans might want to follow her, is all I'm saying. Thank you very uh, much for that dose of sensibility and logic. Jameis Fathers First, 86, says, Seriously, Bench, Webb, and Davis. Chimes in again on that. Adam Dyson says, Sierra Nevada here. Everyone take 10 seconds. Grab your glass. Toast your boy Roy and the beloved. Finish your drinks. Go. Up tears of that. Mmm. Didn't take me 10 seconds, though, but I, I'm drinking out of a short cognac glass. Good one there by Adam Dyson. Absolutely. 
Again, we shouldn't be fighting with each other. We should be respecting each other's opinions. And I've seen way too much of that. That's the one thing I don't like and that I keep seeing too much of. Why can't it be that people can agree to disagree and they can be respectful to each other? Why is it that if you don't agree with me, then all of a sudden I'm a homer or I'm a meatball or, you know, I mean, come on, be respectful. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion. And don't worry, if somebody's opinion differs from you, if you're tired of people hating on color, let them hate on color. It's no big deal. It doesn't even matter what people think about color. It ain't going to win games, and it ain't going to lose games what people think about color or what people think about the team. What matters is what they do on the football field, and they could care less about what people outside think. That's why I say there's no sense in getting your panties in a bunch or your male thong in a bunch to start fighting your fellow fan because they don't agree with you. Moving right along, Eric Rogan says the Bears limited the reigning NFL MVP to just one touchdown. That's something that will go unnoticed until we play them again. Bob Harper, my man, chimes in. Robes Bear, the man of good wit and good wisdom. I thought the Rams would be pushovers. They looked okay Sunday after the Bears' performance. I can't believe we're favorites. <laughs> well said, Bob. And T. Worth chimes in again, flashing those guns, saying on a positive spin, the defense looks good. The D-line is getting pressure. Absolutely. Thank you very much, T. Worth. I lost in all of this, and that's probably the only reason why the defense is upset about it. The line has all this Cutler information, you know, him taking all the heat and everybody not looking at the – that's one thing definitely lost in the shuffle. Bears are no way were they going to get to Aaron Rodgers, right? And I think, if I'm not mistaken, Aaron Rodgers got sacked five times – and hit maybe seven times. I'm trying to look here. Aaron Rodgers ended up getting sacked five times for a loss of 31 yards. He ended up getting hit a total of six times, but that does include those five sacks. So, yes, Shea McClellan came in. Corey Wooten again. Shout out to Corey Wooten again. Looking like he wants to stay. And I didn't get a chance to read the article that was put out there talking about how Corey Wooten has supposedly been getting an extra love and attention from one of the coaches or one of somebody. I'm not sure who it is. I didn't read the article, but I look forward to reading it here. But thank you very much, T-Worth, for allowing uh, people to not overlook that excellent uh, subject right there. And Tim Jennings, too. Tim Jennings, two games in a row. People, we don't have DBs. Our DBs suck. And it went from Tim Jennings sucks to, to now Charles Tillman sucks. So there's a lot of people that got DB issues out there. But I don't know, man. I, I, I got some tissues for your DB issues. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> Moving right along. Uh, Christian Von Lopik chimes in and says, while at the game, and Christian was at the game, saw poor blocking and bad play calling. Why are they calling long plays? They need to get the ball out fast like Aaron Rodgers. Again, I think it's because Mike Tice is very obsessed with the explosive plays. And part of it is you have faith in your offense. They played one good, really good week against a, a Colts team whose defense is better than we made them look, right? And we saw that last week. Uh, and so you have confidence. You want to you want to build on it. And Tice, maybe he gave them a little bit too much to handle, a little bit too much to chew on, if you will. But he thought they could handle it. He had faith in him. He had confidence in him. He wanted to build on it. The only thing was he stuck with it a little too long, had a little too much faith in them. But I guarantee you that's not the kind of thing that's going to go on week after week after week. All right? You can sacrifice maybe one or two games with that belief, but then, hey, change has got to be made, and they're making a change on the line already. Aaron Reyes says, I guess I'll be the one to ask, is it just me, or was Major right out of position still making mistakes? You know what? I don't know. I did not look at the defensive tape. Um, you're not the first person to ask that or to mention that. I saw a lot of people actually uh, dogging on Major right quite a bit, too. So, I, you know what? I, I'll have to you know, uh, assume that you saw something and that you were paying attention because I wasn't looking and I'm not going to say yay or nay on it. But it is duly noted. I have favorited it so that I can take a look at it here. And we're going to get to some more tweets finishing off the CFT Bears so you can get back to the Monday night football game. Uh, Lauren Cox says the offensive line can only be better than last year, more experienced, and it wasn't horrible last year with Cutler in. When he was in there, it will get better. That's uh, Lauren Kyle's trying to calm everyone down. Eric Grogan says the Packers are a good team and the Bears lost to a good team. That's really all that happened. No more and no less. 
Adam Dyson chimes in again and says, Brad Biggs says Shiloh Rochelle is starting left guard next week. Gulp. Jay Cutler may be a bear down. <laughs> Absolutely. Again, I, I don't expect it to be much improvement, and I wouldn't be surprised if they end up putting Spencer back in there, or maybe they put a Chris Williams in there. And we might find out as the week progresses, as the media is able to watch a few more minutes of practice, that uh, they're giving Chris Williams snaps uh, at, at left guard also. Ruben in the city says, yes, the game was messed up with the fake field goal and bad offense. The defense was great. Karimi uh, penalty blew a crucial opportunity without a doubt. And Hassan Nawaz chimes in and says, Forte, will he be back soon? Dallas game or earlier or later? Let me get my calendar out and let me do a prediction here as to when one Matt Forte will be back. Matt Forte, I think Dallas is a great game to point out. Uh, again, Dallas is going to be on a Monday night game. So he won't have to come back uh, on Sunday or, or on, you know, he's going to have extra time. They, they played on Thursday. He hurt his knee or his ankle in the second half of the game on Thursday. Thursday, that would be, let's take a look at my calendar here. That would have been Thursday the 13th. The Bears play Sunday the 23rd. And the next time they play is going to be when Matt Forte might play if he's out this week, is going to be November 1st. So he would have had uh, 20, geez, what is it, 14, almost two and a half weeks already to heal. So they're saying two to four weeks. I could see Forte coming back for that Dallas game. That's a very good uh, assessment there. Benny Dallas says, I'm not watching the Monday night football game. <laughs> or he's asking if I'm not watching the Monday night football game. No, I'm about to be. I wanted to start this earlier, but I spent a lot of time working on some technology for Chicago Football Talk that you might see very soon, testing it out. So I normally am going to, tr whenever we do Chicago Football Talk Lives on Monday night, and you can put this down now, we're going to be shooting for 530 people. So you're going to have a half hour to get from your jobs if you have nine to fivers. And I want to finish with the time so that you can watch the Monday night football game without having to be distracted. You know how I do care about you guys. We're all football fans and that's what I want to do. So 530 is going to be the target time on Mondays when the bears aren't playing on Mondays. So Christian Von Lopik says, uh, in Rogers MVP season, he only faced one top 10 defense all year and lost to the chiefs. Benny Dallas says for you, not watching Peyton Manning has thrown two first quarter interceptions. Benny down and this is the interesting thing because Eric Grogan I talked with Eric Grogan and he was going to write a piece that I recommended he did write a piece I should say that that was going to focus on some of the Cutler stuff but I told him you know what I've gone down this road before you don't want to do that you're gonna have a lot of people jumping on your back so I want to give a shout out to Eric Grogan because his article was about interceptions and great quarterbacks who throw interceptions this is something I've said a lot but I knew because fans, they don't care about that. And they're not worried so much about Cutler's interceptions as they were about his demeanor, yelling at Webb. Players have terrible interception games, especially quarterbacks that have great confidence in themselves. I think Peyton Manning had like a five or six interception game not too long ago, or a game where, pardon me, he had three or four interceptions in one half. I want to say that was two years ago, the last time he played for the Colts. He had a four interception game in one half. So... To Eric Grogan, uh, who was also pointing that out, you see Benny Dallas is with you there too, also pointing it out live on this show, Peyton Manning has thrown two first quarter interceptions. So I, I'm not going to say, you know, he probably didn't yell at his left tackle though, and that's what got fans more upset about, and that's what leads me to like what I was talking about with Eric Grogan. But again, I mean, interceptions, yes, they happen. Christian Von Lopik says, I love that McClellan showed up. Didn't let Rodgers run away from him exactly why we drafted him. Absolutely, the athleticism did show up on uh, uh, from one Shea McClellan. And I see Travis Mitchell's chiming in. Vex Rex, welcome to the show, my friend. I think times like this is when Lovey Smith shows his worth as a coach. Strong locker rooms are from leaders and coaching. You know what? I, I got to agree with you there. I'm going to cheers you on that one. I know a lot of people want to see Lovey Smith go, so I'm not going to be critical of you guys who want to see Lovey Smith go. But the way Lovey Smith responded today, even to DJ Moore's comments as the uh, journalist, you know, basically not ambushed him. I don't want to say that, but they basically confronted Lovey Smith with DJ Moore's comments that they got and he hadn't had, yet heard him. Lovey Smith didn't bat an eye. He's like, I, I give, you know, I'm going to give props to DJ Moore because at least he wasn't an anonymous source or unnamed person. He's entitled to say what he wants to say. But he moved on, and the whole team should move on. The whole city should just move on. I think Jason Campbell said it best. Be better, not bitter. 
It's all in the past already. Keep everything in perspective. One game doesn't mean we're the season's done and we don't need to play the rest of the 14 games or watch the, the Bears play the rest of the 14 games. So Travis uh, Mitchell hit the nail on the head there. Lovey Smith is definitely getting everybody to just move on and, and not worry about it. I mean, you pour salt in the wound. That's done already. That was last week's game already, all right? And Eric Grogan says, Lance Lewis had a pretty good game, in my opinion, but what did you think of Garza and Karimi? Karimi, there were some mauling blocks that Karimi had. Garza also had miscommunication issues, but Lance Lewis, he played a, a, a very good game. I don't think he had a great game, and I think he's getting, a, people are overlooking there's mistakes that Lance Lewis made also in this game. Nobody played a perfect game, and definitely Lance Lewis did not play a perfect game. When I went back through the tape with a fine-tooth comb, I see Lance Lewis making mistakes in that game also. So, um, but yes, he of all the linemen that played, I think him or he probably had the best game just because when you include Karimi's unnecessary roughness penalty. But Lance Lewis had mistakes in that game too where he didn't hold on to his blocks long enough while Jay Cutler was trying to scramble. There's a couple of plays I can think of right now, mechanical plays where people were critical of Cutler for throwing near interceptions or for holding on to the ball too long. And it was caused by Jay Cutler trying to scramble, wanting to scramble, and Lance Lewis not holding on to his block on the right side long enough to allow Jay Cutler to actually scramble for positive yards. I'm sure everybody was cheering when Cutler picked up that first down when he scrambled along the left side when he ended up having words with Eric Walden after he got up. You can't have your cake and eat it too. He was trying to scramble to make more plays when you criticize him for holding on the ball too long, but the offensive line was not holding on to their blocks. Go back and look at the tape. You will see what I saw. Squirtle says, yeah, me neither. Who cares about Monday night? Oh, oh, oh. I hear you. You know what? If it ain't the Bears, that's what I say. The Bears, uh, are the Bears playing tonight? That's what I say. But no, G Squirtle says, I think people just don't like Jay. So no matter what he does, he's wrong. And if he sat in a corner, he doesn't care. I know. Honestly, uh, and again, I'm not going to defend Cutler on this whole situation, but it was real funny how... Last year, in the last two or three years, Jay Cutler didn't show enough fire. Didn't look like he cared enough. Didn't look like he had enough emotion. He comes out and shows too much emotion, now, I guess, when he gets... And you know what? I remember back in the day, you know, I would see, you know, other Bears quarterbacks that are celebrated, like Jim McMahon, also yell at his offensive lineman, too. So, anyway, enough about Cutler. We're going to move on to the Rams. I want to thank everybody for watching Chicago Football Talk Live. Always my pleasure. We didn't even take a break. We went about an hour and 20 minutes, but I want to let you guys go so that you guys can watch the rest of this football game, Monday Night Football, uh, the Broncos versus the Falcons. The Bears should have an eye on the Falcons as well. Thank you, everyone, for participating. As always, this will be podcasted. This will be archived. I see the recording did not miss a beat. You can catch it on iTunes later. Keep an eye out for Chicago Football Talk on YouTube because that is where I will be posting a breakdown video, which I hope to get up tonight, where I break down at least, at least the first play. And another video I'd like to do is uh, the adjustments and how they should have been made a little bit sooner, the Brandon Marshall adjustments that I mentioned. So thanks again. As always, your boy Roy, raise the glass. I hope you guys win your fantasy games. We got the Rams this week. I ain't going to say it's going to be easy like everybody else wants to. We just take it one game at a time, and we'll see what happens. Your boy Roy for Chicago Football Talk. Love all the fans out there. Peace, and I'm out.